why did you decide to go out on your own and what makes a mirror realty different than the other realtors? So that was the biggest part. I, I One, I wanted to get away from any franchise. So it was locally owned and operated small. So I had more control over it so that I could kind of set my own fees, set my own structure with my people and didn't have to answer to the big corporations. It wasn't really in Johnson County. There's a lot of big franchise real estate agents in Johnson County, but there's only a few that are actually just only owned and operated in Johnson County. So that was a big thing for me is I just want to set aside and be a Johnson County locally owned and operated agency. Welcome to another episode of Best of Johnston County, brought to you by Breeden Law Office. Our host, Jonathan Breeden, an experienced family lawyer with a deep connection to the community, is ready to take you on a journey through the area that he has called home for over 20 years. Whether it's a deep dive into the love locals have for the county or unraveling the complexities of family law, Best of Johnston County presents an authentic slice of this unique community. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Best of Johnston County podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Breeden, and today we have with us realtor, good friend of mine, Donald O'Meara. We're going to talk a little bit about the O'Meara Realty Group his involvement in the community with GCAA and downtown Smithfield development and some of the other community service activities he does, as well as why he loves Johnston County and how he got here. Welcome, Donald. Thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate it being here. So I'm looking forward to it. Well, cool. Well, first, just, I guess, introduce yourself to the audience, your name, where you're from, where you grew up, all that good stuff. Gotcha. So Donald O'Meara, obviously owner of O'Meara Realty Group and our office is in Smithfield, North Carolina. I'm originally from Ashburn, Virginia, which is right near Dulles Airport in the Northern Virginia area. We moved here in 2012 and I started real estate here in 2014. So, Oh my goodness. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. And I think you were a college basketball player. I played at Pfeiffer University and there's right outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. And then I coached at UNCW and Washington and Jefferson College in Pennsylvania. Right. And when you were a coach, I think you coached women. Yep. Coached women's basketball, I guess. And you were fairly successful at it. Yeah, we did. And then when I went to Virginia, I was actually a high school girls basketball coach. Jokingly, the Marv Levy of girls basketball. <laughs> I lost three state championships in a row. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That's tough. So you and uh, Kyle Shanahan of the San Francisco 49ers. <laughs> Feeling the same pain. Right. Now he's lost two Super Bowls as a head coach. And then he was the office coordinator when Atlanta blew the 28 to three lead to the uh, New England Patriots. So, but before Andy Reid won three Super Bowls, he had lost some Super Bowls too. So, I, to loose right. Well, I, I think you're a great coach when you get to a state championship or if you get to a Super Bowl or anything like that, whether you win the actual game or not, because you wouldn't be there if you weren't a great coach. Right. right. So, I've always said great coaches come from great players. So. Right. So why did you transition out of coaching and into real estate? In all honest truth, one was just kind of lifestyle where we moved and financially looking to get a better lifestyle for my family. There's not as a lot of money in teaching and coaching, right? <laughs> Especially at the lower level. That and just, uh, you know, when I started having kids, time. So I wanted something to allow me more time. And really, I take my passion for coaching into real estate working with new real estate agents and clients and teaching them. And then I still get to coach my son, which is a cool part right. for me. So I guess the next question would be, you were coaching, you played college basketball, and then you were coaching high school and college basketball. When did you decide to become a realtor and were you originally licensed in Virginia or North Carolina? No, I actually never did real estate until we came to North Carolina. I was actually obviously a teacher and a coach for years. Then I started a small business. I did inflatable party rentals when we were in Virginia. When we moved here, I couldn't really get that off the ground. There was just a lot already going on here. Couldn't get my foot in the door. So my wife has been in the mortgage industry oh, that's true. for years. She was like, you ought to go get your real estate license. And I was like, everybody tries that and fails. <laughs> I don't want to be the next one. And she was like, no, I think you'd be really good. And here we are 10 years later. So when did you get your real estate license? 2014. Okay. So, All right. And then did you immediately open Omir Realty Group? No, then? I started with a bigger franchise. And then I went to a little small firm in Garner for a little while. And then I decided in 2018, I opened Omira Realty Group in Smithfield, and we haven't really looked back. It's been a great experience. Oh, man. Yeah, no, that's great. I remember when you were doing that in Garner. That's when I first met you, right. and, and I was going around. I was like, what is, I see these signs everywhere, <laughs> you know, and then I think we originally met. You ended up, well, we met through GCA, the Greater Cleveland Athletic Association, yes, sir. and then you coached my son's team when he was eight, and I'll never forget when 
He hit a walk-off grand slam, and you picked him up and <laughs> spun him around, running down the into the left field fence. I still have that video on my yeah. phone. That was so much fun back in the days. And that's right when Amir, Miller, Amir really Group was getting started, like 2018, when y'all did that. So why did you decide to go out on your own and what makes Amira Realty different than the other realtors? So that was the biggest part. One, I wanted to get away from any franchise. So it was locally owned and operated small. So I had more control over it so that I could kind of set my own fees, set my own structure with my people and didn't have to answer to the big corporations. It wasn't really in Johnson County. There's a lot of big franchise real estate agents in Johnson County, but there's only a few that are actually just only owned and operated in Johnson County. So that was a big thing for me is I just want to just set aside and be a Johnson County locally owned and operated agency. Okay. And do y'all do anything different for your clients than any other realtors? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is service and being local. We have a team of local real estate closing attorneys so that, you know, depending on where they close, we can try to set that up to where they don't have to drive into Raleigh and have to deal with the hassles of that. We also, you know, being locally owned and operated, we have a lot of connections with local people, so we know what's going on. We know a lot about the communities and maybe what's going next door to you when you move into the communities and just local knowledge like that. And then obviously, like you said, I got a kick started in 2015 to 18 through GCAA, ended up becoming a coach. The first thing we started doing back then was we sponsored our teams and bought t-shirts for all the parents. Right. So it kind of started out as just a little fun thing with the team's name. And then it kind of got to be taken off where everybody's running around here with sold by Donald t-shirts on. (laughs) And kind of like you said, everybody thought my signs and name was everywhere. But at that time, I was really kind of small just trying to do it. Right. Branding, right? No doubt. No doubt. So you got the, uh, I guess, the office space, which is right there in downtown Smithfield, right across from the Little Brown Jug, for those listening. Your windows face the Little Brown Jug right there on, was that Front Street? Yeah, that street's Front Street. Front Street, right, yeah. yeah. So I remember going to the open house. That was in, I guess, 2018, right? Yeah, that was in that summer that you had inflatables. Yeah, 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 we did. But we still had some left over from the business. We hadn't sold completely yet. Right. Well, that was cool. So, I mean, how many agents do you have now? So I have eight total agents and then one office person. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, okay. And, and actually a new intern. We just hired a girl from Cleveland High School who's interning with us and she wants to become a real estate agent. So. I got you. I got you. So what are the initial, if I'm thinking I want to sell my house, what's the first thing I should do? So the first thing I always tell people is you should probably contact three agents, you know, set up a time, have them come to your house and talk about what they think the value of your house is what they're going to do for you, and then what they're going to obviously charge you. That's the most important question for everybody. Right. Okay. And then I guess y'all put together a, I call it a CMA, like a comparative market analysis, right? right, right. right for the client and decide, say, okay, this is what we think we can sell your house for, and this is what you'll make. That's right. Okay. Yeah. I got you. And I guess y'all could also make some suggestions of paint, carpet, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So typical listening point for me, you call me, I'll come into your house. We'll go over numbers of recent sales, comparables to your house. We'll talk about what I'm going to do to market it, how I can set myself apart from the right. other 15,000 agents in the Raleigh area. Then we're going to talk about fee structure, how that looks, you know, fees, you know, commissions have to be negotiated. So it depends on whether you're just selling, whether you're selling and buying or whether you're selling and moving somewhere else it kind of makes that structure change. And then we're going to, usually if you decide to hire me, I will come back at a later date and I go room to room with you or somebody on my team does. And we go through and say, okay, let's do this. Let's change this. Let's take this piece of furniture, put it in the garage, kind of stage the home for photos, bring in photos, and then put that awesome circle of mirror realty sign in your front yard and get it going. All right. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about how has the real estate market changed in the last 12 to 18 months with interest rates now running seven, eight, eight and a half percent. When the first 10 years of your career, interest rates were three or 4%. Yeah. So it's definitely changed. It's definitely, you know, I would say when I got in 2014 to 16, it's very similar to right now, even though rates were a little better. Uh, obviously everybody knows during the COVID years, stuff like that, real estate was crazy, two and 3%, you know, multiple offers, bidding wars. We don't see that as much anymore, but we're still a very healthy market, especially in Johnston County. You're looking probably at an average of 30 to 45 days on market now instead of three hours, right? Uh, which is a little bit different, but it, the market is very rate driven. Right there after Christmas, the rates dropped into the sixes and it was boom. Things started selling again. Now they've creeped back up a little bit to sevens. 
and things are a little bit slower. So it changes the buying power for people. And as we all know, affordability in Johnson County has changed. You know, your average of $400,000 homes now when you used to be in the 200. So it makes it Yeah, no, it's gone up substantially. Yes. I mean, during COVID, all of us that are homeowners in Johnson County, just like you are, saw our houses go up $150,000 in 18 months, which is just supply and demand. This is capitalism. You know, and I know people are saying they look at all this growth and stuff. We still have a housing shortage in Johnston County. Don't you agree? Yeah, believe it or not. I mean, and that's what a lot of people say. Well, they're building everywhere, but the majority of those were already sold. You know, there's a catch up point, but where there's new construction coming, there's still not a lot of people reselling because they don't have nowhere to go or if right. they resell, you know, and, and they make $150,000. They're going to turn around and put that right into their house to have a, you know, the same payment they have now. So it's a tough scenario of, you know, when is the right time to sell and buy and, you know, everybody's reasons is different. Yeah. And, you know, and I've said this on the podcast as we've interviewed other builders and people that are in development in the area. And I don't know if people realize, but being a divorce lawyer where you're always looking for a place for your clients to move because all of a sudden this relationship is not working out. You know, there's not enough apartments. There's not enough mobile homes. There's not enough single family homes. I mean, there still is a housing shortage, which does keep the inventory low, which I think you just said 30 days, like we don't have a ton of inventory. Right. And it also continues to drive the prices up despite what the interest rates are. That's right. And a lot of people with a complaint, we had this conversation off camera a little bit about infrastructure. You've got to have infrastructure. So you got to have people to pay for the taxes to pay for the infrastructure, right? And then when the infrastructure catches up, that's only going to make this area expand even more, i.e. Yeah. Um, 540. Um, if we look at historically stats in North Raleigh, before 540 and what happened when 540 was finished, I think we're going to see another uptick here in Johnson County when that's all done. Right. I don't disagree. I mean, and now whether people are going to laugh when they hear this, but Garner is about to be inside the Beltline, ITB, you know, and you think about inside the Beltline Raleigh and Broughton High School and the great na the Mordecai and the great neighborhoods there is the quintessential inside the Beltline. But now Garner is going to be inside the Beltline, and we're going to be right next to the Beltline because 540 comes to exit 309, which is only three miles from 4042. That's right. We're going to be basically the next Wake Forest. You know, and well, I never thought about North that. Raleigh. So, and you mean, look at now, those average median prices in there are 600000 So, which is what we're seeing in some of the new construction on Cleveland Road right now. True Homes and Eastwood have just put in two new subdivisions, and they're starting in the 600s. Man, that's yeah. a lot of money for a house. That, that is, especially in Johnson County. But, you know, but that's a good thing for us in those days. But I agree as a local real estate agent and working with a couple builders that I'm involved with, we all agree that we need to see some more affordable housing in Johnson County. You know, 127 Homes is building quite a few of those, but we need some of the other local small builders to get back into the high twos, $300,000 homes. Right. I think we need more of that. But we've also needed more of the homes. I mean, needed. But when you talk about, I want to sell my home and I'm ready to upgrade, there hasn't been a lot of those 4,000 to 5,000 square foot homes that people might want to upgrade to that would bring six, $700,000. And so I think that has kept some of the houses that might be more affordable off the market because those people who want to move don't have anywhere to go and they don't want to leave Johnson County. Great. I would agree with that. About five years ago, probably if you wanted to sell an upgrade, you were limited to Portofino and a couple of small subdivisions like that with the higher end homes or, you know, custom build on land. And land is, as we all know, has pushed almost out of affordability in Johnson County. I used to jokingly say in about 2000, probably 18, when I was coaching David, that if you should go Benson and buy some land. And now you need to go farther. You got to cross <laughs> 95, really. It's just kind of crazy. I mean, it's crazy. And this area is, you know, it's not just 4042. I mean, it's the entire county. Pine Level had put in a building moratorium last year. It may still be in place. Wilson's Mills is getting a new high school. They've got tremendous growth there. I mean, it's everywhere. Benson is starting to see it. It's not just Clayton. It's not just 42 East, Flowers, whatever. I mean, the entire county is starting to see the growth because people want to live here. This is a well-managed county. The taxes are reasonable. They cut taxes last year where Wake County and Raleigh, the city of Raleigh, raise taxes almost every single year. And so people are wanting to move to Johnson County. There's good schools. The roads are crowded, but okay. And I don't think that's going to change. And there's nothing Jonathan Breen or Donald Amir can do to stop it. So I think we just need to do the best we can for it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I need to say, like you said, that 
there's a reason people are coming here. It's because of obviously locality. I mean, the reason I came here is 2014. You know, you're split halfway between the mountains and the beach. You got the best right. of both worlds. Right. You can go ski in one weekend and you can go to the beach the next weekend. And sometimes in North Carolina, that can be in the same month. No, well, yeah. that's true. <laughs> There's so, no uh, doubt. You know, but you do have great schools. You've got amenities. You are within an international airport within 45 minutes. And that's, you know, me and you could talk all day about athletics, but right. you're right in the heart of the ACC, which right. is phenomenal. So Duke, North Carolina, and Wolfpack fans, I mean, you're right there. So if we could just get them to keep it in Greensboro, that'd be amazing. Right. Have family law questions? Need guidance to navigate legal challenges? The compassionate team at Breeden Law Office is here to help. Visit us at www.breedenfirm.com for practical advice, resources, or to book a consultation. Remember, when life gets messy, you don't have to face it alone. Well, let's switch subjects here and talk a little bit about some of your community involvement. You and I both have been on the Greater Cleveland Athletic Association board. I just have come off. You're still on it. What made you want to get involved with that group, and what have you learned from that involvement? So the, the biggest thing is I started out as a parent as a GCA parent in basketball and in baseball. And then obviously with my love for sports, transitioned into coaching pretty fast. And then once I got in there, you know, I used to get a lot of questions from clients, people moving in, you know, why does GCA do this? Why does, you know, <laughs> and I said, that's a great question. I don't know. So there was a board meeting one night and I went up in there and the next thing I know I'm on the board. So, and I still don't know why GCA does some certain things, but I just wanted to be involved in the community and to be more than just a coach or try to help out with some bigger decisions planning and seeing what was coming for the future. Cause that also helps me in the real estate business to know that, Hey, we do have a park. It might not be for our kids or probably right. for our grandkids, but at least it's in the plans and it, there's a want for it, a need and it's happening. So that was a big thing. Same thing with Swift Creek Boosters Club. I jumped on that probably six years ago. My son wasn't even there. My daughter didn't play sports, but you know, I just wanted to be a part of the athletic department, help out, help them raise money, you know, gain a brand new school. Very neat opportunity, and it's been a fun ride. Yeah, I know you often work the concession stands at the Swift Creek Middle <laughs> School games, and we have a little friendly rivalry when Cleveland Middle plays Swift Creek Middle. I'm always cheering for the Cleveland Middle teams, and he's always cheering for the Swift Creek Middle teams. But we can all agree that Cleveland High School is great, and the football team there, and the athletics there, and we're all Rams at heart here, out here in the Cleveland community. Tell me a little bit, I know you're involved with the Downtown Smithfield Development Association. Tell people what that is and what it does. So yeah, I'm not on the board, but I do a lot of stuff with them, I think. So they basically run a lot of the activities like Ham and Yam, Third Street Eatery and stuff like that. But really it's about a promotion of downtown Smithfield businesses. And I guess I, want, I don't want to call it a revamp, but just uh, bringing businesses, small businesses to Smithfield. You know, for the longest time, nobody really went there unless it was for the court, <laughs> you know about. But if you have that being your hub for the courthouse and all the people that are in and out of that, either attorneys or clients, stuff like that, you need restaurants, you need stuff for them to do and eat and shop. And just since I went into the 2018, it's been a huge change in downtown Smithfield. They've brought in some great new restaurants. There's been expansion of local. They've redone the theater on the Noose River now, and now they can have concerts, wine walks, that, you know, just a lot of stuff that people don't even know is going on right there in their back pocket. So it's been a great thing for Smithfield. Yeah. Well, what are some of your favorite restaurants? I have my favorite restaurants in town in Smithfield. What are some of yours? So yeah, I hit them all. And I've hit <laughs> a lot of them, but I would say my top one is go is I love a greasy spoon at the diner. Okay. Um, I, the I do diner. love the diner, especially for breakfast. Sammy's Pizza, and they've opened up a bar now, which is pretty neat. Oh, I did not so, know that. Yeah, so they've okay. got a nice bar in there now. And Char Grill for a hamburger. You can't really beat a Char Grill hamburger. It doesn't matter what day of the week I go in there. They're lined up to the door, and you're out in five minutes if you need to be. And, you know, love it or leave it, crickets is amazing. Crickets, that's <laughs> true. I mean, crickets is a staple, no it doubt. Is. Yeah, well, and I think that Downtown Smithfield Development Association and the town of Smithfield have done a nice job. You know, they lit up the trees, which yeah. some people thought was a waste of money, but it looks great. And they've got more events at Christmas. You can do the horse-drawn carriages and do lots of Christmas decorations. And I would say anybody that's not spending time in downtown Smithfield, you should go. I think you would find it exciting. And there's a lot of great businesses there. Same thing with Selma with the antiques and that kind of stuff. And I think, I guess before we get out of here, you or your wife are part owners of Celtic Creamery, which is not exactly in downtown Smithfield, but right outside of Smithfield. We're right on the edge. Yeah. We don't fall under the downtown Smithfield jurisdiction, unfortunately, but we do a lot with them. We set up obviously at the Ham and Yam Festival and things, but yeah, 
Not to give an uh, unsolicited plug, but no, yeah, no, Johnson Creamery Joko <laughs> right on two ten as you're going into Smithfield. Best ice cream in Johnson County, in it's, my opinion. It's excellent ice cream, and it's open year round, which some ice cream places That's are right. not. And uh, they have a food truck, and if you have an event or would want them, they will be happy to come out and serve ice cream at any event that you have. And they're open, and it's great service, and they're constantly changing the menu. And I have to be real careful with the chocoholic stuff because I don't really need all that. But yeah, it's excellent. And th that's been a nice get for that part of Smithfield because there really wasn't a retail business over there. I guess there was a gun shop where the creamery is now a few years ago. So that was good to get. And it's open seven days a week, I believe. It will be coming in the spring. And the winter, we close on Mondays. But, okay. Um, but we're open seven days a week and we extend our hours in the summertime. Oh, that's um, awesome. Now, obviously, we have a lot of young Johnson County kids working there for us too, so which is really cool. There. Right. Well, it's great. I absolutely love Celtic Creamery and I go there probably too much. So how can the listeners get in touch with you and your organization? Right. So obviously, we have a website sold by donald.com um, our office line is 919-937-2618 you can call text or email that 24 hours a day you can email me directly at donald at soldbydonald.com and we have uh, the same facebook instagram snapchat all the good stuff oh yeah there. well we've got some of that too at green law office i don't exactly know how it works but i have it and yeah. so anyway it's fascinating well cool well the last question we always ask the guest on this program is what do you love most about johnston county so, I, I mean, I, that's a hard answer, but the biggest thing that brought me to Johnson County was the small town feel. Everybody knows your name, kind of you recognize people at the stores, but yet you still had everything you needed. And then obviously locality, you know, right here between 40 and 95, you can get almost anywhere you want. And, you know, that's a big thing. So, you know, being that, and then obviously, you know, good school system, stuff like that. So it, there's a lot of things that bring you to Johnson County. But I think the biggest thing to me is that even though it's growing like crazy, it still has got a small town feel. Well, that's great. And I would agree with that. I still like the small town feel and seeing my neighbors and knowing everybody and meeting new people. I love to meet new people too. So we want to thank Donald O'Meara for coming on to the Best of Johnson County podcast. If this is your first time listening or watching this podcast, feel free to like, subscribe, or follow this podcast wherever you're seeing it, and whether it be Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or on any of our social media channels or any of, any of Donald Mirror's social media channels so that you'll be aware of future episodes of the Best of Johnson County podcast. And if you would be kind enough to leave us a five-star review down at the bottom, it will help with our exposure so other people will know about the Best of Johnson County podcast. New episodes come out every Monday. And so be looking for them. If this is your first time listening, feel free, go back, listen to some of the previous episodes, including the one with Adrian O'Neill, the Johnson County Parks and Rec Director, or Patrick Harris, Johnson County Commissioner, or Ted Godwin, Johnson County Commissioner, about where this county's going and some of the infrastructure plans that they are put in place and that are coming. By listening to this podcast, you will learn a ton about Johnston County and where it's going and how the leaders of this county and the small businesses see its future and how you can play a part in it. Until next time, I'm your host, Jonathan Breeden. That's the end of today's episode of Best of Johnston County, a show brought to you by the trusted team at Breeden Law Office. We thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to sharing more interesting facets of this community next week. Every story, every viewpoint adds another thread to the rich tapestry of Johnston County. If the legal aspects highlighted raise some questions, Help is just around the corner at www.breedenfirm.com.